right, all right, all right. Let's get started. Hello, everybody. So a different backdrop today. I'm at the same table, but I, I'm working on something over there, so I had to move to another corner. Hopefully, everybody is okay and uh, not going to waste much more time because we have a lot to cover today. Um, we're going to talk about uh, cross products, lines, and planes. Uh, but to kind of hammer it home, it's going to take a lot of examples. So we probably should just uh, jump into it. So let's just go right into one note here. And as always, or as we've been doing recently, I'm going to turn off my camera and uh, we shall start moving. So let's. Uh, uh, some people are still trickling in here, um, but yeah, let's uh, let's get a move on. Uh, move this chat box out of the way. Okay, all right. So today, which I had expected to start this uh, on in Monday's class, but whatever. Uh, let's go. Uh, we are going to talk about the cross product. Uh, so hopefully, you remember a lot of the motivational uh, things. Uh, not motivational, like gung ho, let's do this. Motivational, like why do we care about finding certain objects? Why do we care about being able to um, find things that are perpendicular and all that good stuff? Finding areas and angles and all that. So hopefully you remember all that stuff because I'm not going to go over it. I just want to actually jump into the math. Uh, conceptually, the background uh, I think I filled in too much. So let's actually just jump right into it. So. You might have remembered in the previous section, we spoke about uh, how knowing how a plane is slanted in space is going to be very important. And the fact that the best kind of direction to describe this slant is going to be a direction that is orthogonal, quote unquote, to the plane. So remember the word orthogonal is just another word for perpendicular. Orthogonal just means it meets at right angles at 90 degrees, pi over two radians. Um, but it's just, it's a more general form of perpendicular. Okay. so. Uh, the best direction to actually describe in which a plane is tilting is the normal direction, an orthogonal direction. So now we are going to turn our attention to being able to find such a direction. So given a plane, uh, the goal is going to be, how do we find something that is normal to the plane? And as we saw last time, an, an easy way to actually accomplish this is to actually find two vectors in the plane, non-parallel, and then find a vector that is orthogonal to both of those vectors at the same time. If we're orthogonal to only one vector at a time, we cannot be guaranteed to be orthogonal to the plane itself. We have to be orthogonal to two vectors in the plane at a time, and that will allow us to be orthogonal to the plane. So that is our goal for the first section of the class. Our goal is to find such a vector. Given two vectors, let's find a vector that is actually orthogonal to both of them. And at the outset, I'm going to actually, you know, like Babe Ruth pointing into, into the stands when he's going to hit a home run, I'm actually going to call out the guy that we're going to find, and he is going to be this guy specifically. So given vectors A and B, we are going to find a vector that is orthogonal to both A and B. And at the same time, it, we would want it to have the magnitude that is the same as the area of the parallelogram formed by A and B. Now, this secondary condition, the fact that we want the magnitude to be uh, magnitude A, magnitude B sine theta, is something that's kind of uh, going to come out of nowhere. There are two ways in which you can see that this guy was a rise. Um, there's going to be a certain, there's going to be a way that we're going to derive this vector. Uh, in and there's going to come a point where we can kind of do the simplest, easiest uh, choice for a solution that we can find, and that is going to be the guy. So, for example, I believe where were we? Let me do this. And and by the simplest thing, I, I mean a situation like this. 
Or when we're in this situation, and technically we could have found, picked any constants for the Bs. I just picked the ones that were easiest, that didn't involve any scaling, that just has the opposite sign of the opposite guy. So there is a way that you could derive this vector where you'll get to a point like this, and you're going to want to make the obvious choice to get that equation to work out. And it turns out if you make the obvious choice, uh, the magnitude of the vector is going to end up being this way, this guy. So you can see it in hindsight that this would be the magnitude that you want. Um, other than that, though, there are actually aesthetic and philosophical reasons for why we would want this to be the magnitude. I'm not going to go into that, though, because you don't need to know them. But if anyone's actually interested, uh, this link over here would take you to a website where uh, a guy actually explains kind of from scratch, why would the sine of theta be involved here? Why would we guess that it should be involved? Uh, and all that good stuff. Uh, but for now, I'm just saying, this is the guy we're going to find. So here are, I have two vectors, A and B. These guys are in R3. So we're going to set things up for R3 specifically, and I'll talk about other dimensions soon. We're going to define a vector that is, we are going to call the cross product. The cross product is going to be a vector that is orthogonal to both A and B, and it is going to have magnitude that is the air of the parallelogram formed by A and B. So if N is a normal vector, the vector we want to find is this scalar multiple of N, assuming that N is a unit normal. Okay, so I, I should have said is a unit vector. Okay, so, um, and you know what, I, I feel like I'm going to forget to change that for the other section too. So maybe I should put that in. And I should put that in. Let's go back to it. Okay, so I want a vector that's parallel to the normal vector to the plane, to a unit normal, with this magnitude. Uh, some things I want you to immediately note. The cross product is a vector. When you take the cross product, A cross B, as this guy is called, the result is a vector because it is a scalar times a vector. So it is itself a vector. Yes, what's inside the parentheses is a scalar. That highlighted just now is a scalar. This is the magnitude of the vector A. This is the magnitude of the vector B, and this is just the sign of the angle in between A and B. So, uh, so this first part here is a, a scalar, and I am multiplying by a normal vector. Okay, so the cross product itself is a vector. So the cross product of two vectors is another vector. Remember that the dot product was a scalar. Here are some other things I want you to note. Uh, the notion of a cross product as we'll do it uh, is specifically for three dimensions. A cross product does not really make sense in two dimensions. Um, if you could define something like cross product in two dimensions, it actually wouldn't be a vector. It would actually be the area of the parallelogram. Uh, so that doesn't make any too much sense for us. And in higher dimensions, um, there is a higher kind of product called an exterior product or a wedge product that would generalize the cross product. Cross product, as we're going to look at it, the guy that we refer to as a cross product, is a three-dimensional thing. Um, if you want the more generalized product, here's a link, but just be warned, uh, that link uh, takes you to mathematical knowledge that is like two hard years of intense studying of abstract mathematics. Uh, if in two years you're still interested in this, uh, you can go to that link. Probably not going to do you much good right now. Um, but this one is pretty uh, user-friendly at the moment. So. That's the other thing I want you to note. The cross product as we'll do it is a three-dimensional thing. So highlight we're looking in R3 here. Um, another thing that should be clear, sine theta is going to be a part, a, a multiple of this vector, a scalar multiple. What that therefore means is that if your theta is zero or pi, then what is going to happen is that the cross product will actually be zero, the scalar is zero times the normal vector, which is actually, uh, the zero vector. So what does that mean for us? Well, for one, it means that the magnitude of the cross product can be written as the magnitude of this, which is just the magnitude of A, uh, A times magnitude of B times magnitude of sine theta. But it also means that if your theta is zero or pi, 
then your sine of theta is going to be zero or pi. And so we can immediately get this thing. So we are expanding on uh, these maxims that we had from the last time. Uh, we know that A and B are orthogonal if the dot product is the zero scalar. We know they're parallel if one is a multiple of the other. But now we know that they are parallel, meaning the angle between them is zero or pi, if the cross product is the zero vector. Or equivalently, we can say the cross product has magnitude of the zero scalar. So these are just uh, some things that we should be aware of. Dot product is zero means you're orthogonal. The magnitude of the cross product is zero means that you are parallel. And if one vector is a multiple of the other, it also means that you're parallel. So there are a couple ways that we can talk about things being parallel here um, in terms of magnitudes of, a, of, of, ve of vector products. Okay, now the fourth thing I want you to note, once we have a plane where we have uh, A's and B's working out here, uh, so like this is my A and this other guy is my B, I want you to appreciate that there are actually two possibilities for who we want to pick for the normal vector. We could have the one pointing in this direction, but the one pointing in exactly the opposite direction at an angle pi away from this one is also perpendicular or orthogonal to both vectors at the same time. So in the interest of making sure that everyone is going to come up with the same answer at any given time, and we have coherency of calculations, we invent a convention kind of like how PEMDAS is a convention, so that we're all on the same page. We will take the cross product to be the vector that obeys the right-hand rule. Now, this is not the right-hand rule, so that's this guy here, right-hand rule is what I mentioned here. Not your grandmother's right-hand rule, not your right-hand rule from physics, but this is another rule that's going to talk about what direction the normal vector, the cross product should be pointing in relation to the two vectors being involved. And here's how the right-hand rule works. If you want to find A cross B, you will take your right hand, you'll point in your, your pointing finger in the direction of A, your middle finger should point in the direction of B, and when you stick your thumb up, you will point in the direction of A cross B, right? Another way you can do that is to point your hand like directly out in the direction of A, curl your fingers, just make a fist. The, the fist should curl in the direction of B, and if you stick your thumb up, that's the direction of A cross B. One thing I do want you to appreciate is that if you were to do B cross A, to get the right hand to work, you will literally have to turn your right hand upside down. So in this picture here, A cross B is actually the guy that's pointing downwards. And I want you to appreciate that. This vector here is going to be the vector A cross B. And this vector up here is going to be the vector B cross A. And I also want you to appreciate that they're actually the negatives of each other. Okay. And we take this convention by the right hand rule. Okay. So you have a bunch of examples where A cross B is pointing up. This is an example where A cross B is pointing down and you can try it. Point your index finger in this direction and then stick out your middle finger so it points in this direction. You will have to turn your right hand upside down in order to accomplish that. And so putting this all together, here's the vector that we want to find. Given a vector B and A, we want to find a purple vector that is orthogonal to both, and its magnitude is actually the area of the parallelogram. So this is the guy we're in search of. Okay, so now we fully understand hopefully, what the cross product is and what direction it should be pointing in. Let's actually uh, talk about some of its properties. These you can derive from what I said before, and you'll be able to derive it from what I'm going to say in the future as well. So like A cross B is minus B cross A. All this good stuff makes a lot of sense. Um, there are some geometric arguments to be made here as well. And this is kind of like well, if you take one side of the parallelogram and multiply it by a constant, then the entire area gets multiplied by that constant. Things of that sort is, is our arguments that you can use here, but I don't want to get too much into that right now. Um, some things that are not listed here. Uh, if you take a, a vector cross part with a zero vector, the result is the zero vector. Um, if that's not obvious to you why that would be the case, uh, I will 
we, what we're going to do later is also going to make that obvious, so we won't uh, do it much right now. Another thing I want to point your attention to is the fact that uh, the cross product is not commutative. This means the order of the multiplication actually matters. The dot product was commutative. So a dot b is equal to b dot a. This is not true for the cross product. In fact, if you turn around the elements of the cross product, you actually get the negative of the other answer. So a cross b is actually the negative of b cross a. One thing that's not listed here at all, and I want to make sure that you know it's not because they forgot to put it in, it's actually not true. The cross product is not associative. So associate, associative means if you have three of them in a row, it does not matter if you take the first pair or the second pair. What I'm saying is that that is not true for the cross product. In other words, what I'm saying is if you're talking about A cross B cross C, and you think, okay, if I, I can cross product these two and then cross product the result with C, is that going to be the same as if I uh, cross product the B and the C first? and then cross product that result with A. It turns out that no, that is not true. So another thing that's important with a cross product uh, is that it's not associative. So if you have three cross products in a row, it actually matters greatly which cross products you would do first. And so you would want to make sure that if you're ever in a situation where you want to do three cross products, you have to indicate with parentheses which two you want to do first because it will matter. Okay, so there are some properties. All right, now I will mention two of these properties specifically will have applications, but we'll only talk about the application of the fifth one. So the fifth one has a name, it's called the scalar triple product. And what the scalar triple product is, if you take A, B, and C, and imagine that they are just running along the edges of a parallelogram, this expression, on either side will actually give you the volume of this parallelogram. A generalized parallelogram like this, a three-dimensional parallelogram, we call it a parallelopiped. Parallelopiped. Uh, I, I typed that word out somewhere. Where did I put it? Uh, we'll, we'll do it later. Uh, it's called a parallelopiped. And uh, this expression, a dot b cross c, is going to give you the volume of this guy, the signed volume. It might give you the negative volume. And again, that's because we can make area arguments here. If we plug in this definition for the cross product, you'll realize that it's, it'll be equivalent to the area of the base times the height. And again, that's using trigonometry with this angle theta. Um, we'll talk about that later on. Uh, this guy here, this is called the vector triple product. As you can see, that's your A cross B cross C, the guy I spoke about here. And that guy is actually important in uh, physics. So for example, Ke Kepler's law of planetary motion applies this property here. Now in property five, if you actually do that and you get zero as the answer, uh, what is going to happen? Notice that this will give you a scalar answer because it's a vector dot a vector. Um, that means that the uh, parallelopiped has air volume zero, which means that these three vectors actually lie in the same plane and we call them coplanar. Okay, so those are just some definitions. Um, now let's talk about computing the cross product. Okay, so this is a nice definition at all, and this is what a cross product is, but sometimes this isn't very convenient to use at all. How do you even know what this n is? How do you go about finding the components of a cross product? That's what we're going to figure out now. Okay, so here are some things that we would want to be able to see. First of all, applying the right-hand rule on our old axes here, you'll know, for example, that if you take i cross j, you will get the k vector, right? Just by doing the right-hand rule. And you can actually realize that if uh, you can do the right-hand rule, turn your right hand all the way all, in all different orientations by pointing in one of these guys, because all these guys here are at 90 degrees. They're orthogonal to each other. You can use the right-hand rule with your uh, X, Y, and Z plane, and you can pretty much figure out all of these guys at the same time. So I cross J is going to be K, J cross K is going to be I, K cross I is going to be J, and if you, if you, and you'll realize here that that's actually going around this circle clockwise. I cross J is going to be K, K 
K cross I is J, J cross K is I, and so on and so forth. Now, if you go counterclockwise, go around the circle in this way, you will actually have some negative relationships. So for example, I cross K is actually negative J. J cross I is negative K. Uh, I cross K is negative J, and so on and so forth. So these is just, this is, this is just a mnemonic to remember the right-hand rule on the axes. However, um, you should be able to figure out relatively quickly using the right-hand rule all of these relationships here. It is also, should be easy to figure out that I cross I and J cross J and K cross K, these are all zero. Why is that? Because I is parallel to I. And we know that the cross product gives you the zero vector whenever you're doing anything that's parallel. So I is parallel to itself, J is parallel to itself, and K is parallel to itself. So I cross I is the zero vector, J cross J is the zero vector, K cross K is the zero vector. The other ones you can use the right-hand rule to actually figure out that those guys actually obey this relationship. Now, why is that important? Because now we are going to use this knowledge and the properties that we see here, um, specifically, we're going to use properties like this, this one, and property two and three. We're going to use properties two and three, as well as knowledge of this, to actually derive what a cross product would have to look like. So let's actually do that. Let's actually figure out what this guy is going to look like. Um, so let's say I have two vectors. Uh, my A is. So I want to find A cross B, right? Where my A is A1 comma A2 comma A3, my B is B1 comma B2 comma B3, which means if I want to cross product of these, I'm actually cross product in the vectors A1i plus A2j plus A3k. And I want to cross that with B1i cross B2j plus plus B3k. Now from the property above, I'm not gonna scroll up because I can't be bothered. Uh, you should realize that the cross product actually distributes across some. I believe that was property two, if not three. Um, so essentially I can take this guy and multiply everybody over that guy, and then I can factor out the scalars and put them in front. So let's take A1i, multiply everyone here. So I would have A1b1i cross i, plus I would have A1b2, I cross J, remember we want to maintain the order, I is on the left, J is on the right, cross products are not commut commutative, so you have to be careful to maintain the order. A1, B3, I cross K, plus, now let's take A2, J and, and multiply it out. So A2, B1, J cross I, plus uh, A2, B2, J cross J, plus A to B three, uh, J cross K. Keep going. A three B one K cross I, plus A three uh, B two K cross J, plus A three B three K cross K. Now by the above properties of how i, j, k relate to each other, we will know that this here is the zero vector, which means that this entire thing here goes to zero. This here is the zero vector, which means this entire thing goes to zero. This here is the zero vector, which means this entire thing goes to zero. Now, uh, what are some other things that we can apply here? Um, so, if you look up here, again, you now can see what, what would I cross J be? See, I cross J, that is going to be K. If you take I cross K, that is going to be minus J. If you take J cross I, 
you would get minus k. If you take j cross k, joke, you would get i. If you take k cross i, and I, I miss one of the hats here. If you take k cross i, that is j. If you take k cross j, that is minus i. And those guys are all what we're left with. So now what we're going to do is we're going to group all these guys. Uh, let's group the i, j, and k. So what do I have times i? I have a to b3. Uh, oh, did someone say something? Minus uh, a3b2, that times i. Plus, uh, what do I have times k? I have a1b2, oh, not k. Uh, we we want to do j next. Um, so we're going to have uh, j, 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 where are we? Now, I'm going to write it with a negative sign on the outside, and that's just to make it coincide with something we're going to do later. Minus, uh, here, this is a negative j, so it's minus a1b3, minus the other j, a3b1, plus, what do we have for k? a1b2, and the other k is here, minus a2b1. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is your cross product in terms of components. It's going to be A2B3 minus A3B2, comma, minus A1B3 minus A3B1, comma, A1B2 minus A2B1. And that is your cross product. Now, I want to make the, the point uh, that we could also, set, uh, say, C cross A, uh, not cross, set C dot A equals zero, C dot B, equals zero and solve for C. However, by doing that, you'll get a system of equations that will have an infinite number of answers, although all the answers will be parallel to the guy that you want. And if you make the brain dead easy choice, like I pointed to earlier in this lecture, in the, in the first part when we were trying to find an orthogonal vector to a1 comma a2, if you made the brain dead choice, you'll actually get exactly this vector here, right? So this is just another way to do this and, and make a convenient choice. It will actually lead you back to this vector. So that is the vector, that is the cross product. And, um, yeah, now you, you have to, uh, Come again. It is a lot to soak in. Here's the thing: you don't need to actually know how to do this. <laughs> you don't. Need, I'm not, you're never going to be asked to derive the formula for a cross product, but you do need to know how to find the cross product, which means you are going to need a way to know this formula off the top of your head. Which brings us to another thing. <laughs> Oh, the AB sine theta is already built in. The AB sine theta was used in the der derivation of this. So you're, you're not going to need, you're not gonna need it here. Anyway, um, so that's how a cross part looks. That's where, how it would look component wise. Now, of course you might say, how am I gonna remember that? So there is a mnemonic for how to remember this. So that's what we're going to do. So there is a mnemonic and it's using something that we call a determinant, right? So that's a new thing. We're going to use a determinant to remember this, um, which at this point, 
I'm not sure how much I want to say about determinants. We're going to keep it very brief because I don't, I, I don't want to, I'm, I'm already spending more time on this than I wanted to, but I, I want you to see that this formula co doesn't come out of nowhere. That's actually, it, it, it actually was a careful consideration and construction to build up to this guy. So um, let's talk about determinants. So we'll briefly cover determinants. Not comprehensive. Okay, so I'm pretty much gonna tell you the bare minimum of what you need to know in order to compute one of these determinants. And, uh, and hence, you'll use it to help you uh, compute cross products. So uh, let's take some definitions. Uh, the two by two determinant is we write this down, that's the notation. And what that actually means is A times D minus B times C. Okay. Now, what that actually means, now if you're interested in determinants at all, um, what you can do is you can watch my 392 lectures or my 346 lectures because we do go into determinants in detail in those classes. Uh, and I explain kind of from scratch what these numbers would mean and all that good stuff. But right now, just take my word for it. Two by two determinant is this. If you have a square arrangement of numbers with these bars along the side, you take this times this, multiply along the, this diagonal called the main diagonal, and then subtract this times this. So for example, if I ask you, what is the two by two determinant? One, two, three, four. Well, that's going to be one times four minus two times three. So minus two would be the answer. That is the two by two determinant. Now, once you start to go larger, if you start to look at a three by three determinant, okay? So that is a guy that would look like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. And I want to find a number associated with this kind of object. Um, so now what we're going to do, and again, there's a reason why this has to work out the way it works out, but I'm not going to actually explain that. We will do a method called Laplacian expansion. Along the first row. So, and again, Technically, you can do a Laplacian expansion along any row or column of this thing, but we're going to do it along the first row. So we are kind, we're going to expand along the first row here. So this means if I have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, I want to expand along the first row. It's always a plus sign in the top left corner and you alternate signs going throughout the matrix. Uh, but if I'm only focusing on the first row, that would make, this would take a minus sign and that would take a plus sign. So always plus in the top left. Okay, now what does this guy actually look like? It will be a linear combination of two by two vectors. It will be plus A times a certain two by two vector, minus B times a certain two by two vector, plus C times a certain two by two vector. The signs will alternate, plus then minus then plus when you're going along the first row. Now, how do you get the two by two vectors? Um, the first one is going to be followed thusly. Uh, if you look at the matrix, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, when you're focused on the A, 
you're going to block out in your mind everyone in that current row and column and the resulting guy that's left over is the guy that you're going to put in here. So this would be E, F, H, I. You're going to do the same for the other guy. So in A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, when you're focusing on the B, you're going to block out everyone in his row and his column. The guys that are left over, you're going to put them in there. So that is going to be D, F, G, I. And you're going to do this process again uh, for the, the Cs. So let me move the, the chat box out the way here. So here we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and we're focusing on the C part. Block out everyone in his row and his column, whatever is left over, you're going to put in there. So this would be D, E, G, H, okay? So in that way, you can look at a three by three determined as a combination of two by two determinants. And this can go all the way up. So four by four, you can think of it as a sum of three by threes and then you break down each three by threes into two by twos. We will never go, need to go higher than a three by three. So this is what you need to know. And of course, what's going to happen is um, you're going to apply the, the formula for that I mentioned for two by twos. So the first one is going to be E times F minus f times h, e times i, sorry, e times i minus f times h minus d times i minus f times g plus d times h minus e times g. And this is just going to be a number. This we call the three by three determinant. Okay, so uh, let's, and that's all we're gonna do. There is so many more ways that we can look at this guy. We can expand along other rows and columns. We can do Laplacian expansion and all this other, uh, and, and we can do pivotal condensation to make computations easier. But again, that is for another class. We, we're not gonna do that. So let's actually just do an example. So suppose I wanted to find the three by three determinant of one, zero, minus two, three, one, one, minus one, one, two, or whatever, okay? So what we're going to do is I would want to expand along the first row. It is going to be a plus minus plus. So this is going to become one times, block out everyone in his row and his column, you're gonna have one, 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 two, minus zero times, block out everyone in his row and his column, three, one, minus one, two. Now, of course, that's not gonna matter because of the zero. Plus, minus two times, block out everyone in his or in his column, three, one, minus one, one. Moving down, this guy here is of course going to be zero because you're multiplying by zero, so he's not gonna matter. Here, what's going to happen? It's going to be one time, two minus one, because it's this times this minus that times that, minus two times three, plus one, because this time this minus that times that. And so this is one minus uh, eight. So the determinant of this matrix is minus seven. Okay, so that is a three by three determinant. Now, I'm not gonna do any more examples because we're gonna get tons of examples in this kind of thing by doing a bunch of cross products uh, moving forward. So 
With this, I can tell you about the mnemonic, finally. So here is the thing. Uh, and at this point, you can take this to be a definition. So let's suppose my A is A1, comma, A2, comma, A3, and my B is B1, comma, B2, comma, B3. Then I can think of the cross product as a three by three determinant, specifically this three by three determinant. I j and k runs along the first row in the second row i put the components of a which is the guy on the left in the cross product and in the last row i put the components of b which is the guy on the right in the cross product and you can take that to be your definition of the cross product once you understand how to find determinants which with some practice you will uh, just remembering the cross product as this determinant is going to automatically help you to remember the form that we went through earlier. So as, I don't know who, yeah, so as Kevin said, this was a lot to absorb. Hopefully, once you're used to this, this will be a lot easier to absorb. Um, so let's actually do, uh, let's let's do what that would look like. So. With this, I'm going to derive back that formula that we so painstakingly derived earlier. My A cross B is going to be equal to I, J, K, A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3. This is going to be equal to plus I times Block out everyone in this row in this column. So it's going to be A2, B3, minus A3, B2, minus J times, block out everyone in his row in his column, A1, B3, minus uh, A3, B1, plus K times, block out everyone in his row in his column. Uh, you get A1, B2, minus A2, B1, and you will notice that that's the guy from earlier. Ta-da! We now know how to compute a cross product. This vector will have the property that it is orthogonal to both A and B. It will, it will obey the right-hand rule. And its magnitude will actually be the area of the parallelogram formed by A and B. That's the guy. That's the guy that we're after. OK. Now, some of you might have uh, seen uh, determinants before. And so that was supposed to be very smooth. Some of you who have not seen determinants before, that probably was still a little bit too quick for you. And that's completely OK. Uh, what you want to do is you want to go home. Well, you are home. <laughs> you want to stay home, hashtag stay home, and practice uh, finding a bunch of cross products. And uh, you will get used to it. Eventually, uh, like you saw me do here, you'll pretty much be able to do it like in your head. Like you won't need to actually uh, draw out all of this stuff that I did and uh, write all this diagrammatic stuff here. You'll be able to even do it in your head, right? So it is something that if, if you do it a few times, even if you're not, if you, you're not used to taking three by three determinants, eventually you'll, get, you'll be able to get pretty quick with it. Um, so I would say go home, practice, rewatch the video, and uh, do it when I post it later. Uh, it should be. Uh, so a matrix can be related to a vector by the cross product. Well, the determinant of a matrix can be related to a cross product. And 
I don't want you to take this as some sort of mathematical fact or something that has a really deep meaning. For us, it's literally just a mnemonic. It's, it's, it's just one of those things that the math just conveniently works out this way. We developed a determinant for completely separate purposes, but it just so happened to work out that uh, this determinant is going to be the cross product. Now, the truth is a little bit deeper than that, um, but I haven't explained enough to you in order for you to figure that out. So if you go and watch my 392 lectures or my 346 lectures, you will realize that a determinant also has a relationship to the volume of a parallel of pipette. And that's why it's actually a very convenient thing to use here. Because if you look at what a determinant is, like if, if, you, if you look at what this guy is, if you kind of want to give a geometric interpretation to this guy, it's really if you take the three vectors, if you take the vector uh, A, B, and C, where A is just a vector along the first row, B is a vector along the second row, and C is a vector along the third row, and then you form a parallelogram with those guys, then what this number is, what this is, it will actually give you the volume of that parallelogram. And so that's directly related to the scalar triple product, which we had up here, which has cross products in it. So, um, but that you don't really have to know. Actually, you don't need to know any of this. If you know what's in this box and you know how to get to that, we are good. Um, anything beyond that, you have to take a linear algebra class. So, um, uh, let's move on. So that's not, what's the volume of the example you gave us? Where, which example did I give you? Oh, this, yes. So the, if I had vectors one comma zero comma minus two, three comma one comma one and minus one comma one comma two, the volume, if I take all those vectors and stick all their tails together and create a parallelogram kind of like this, the volume actually will be seven. Yeah. So the determinant gives you the signed volume of the parallelopiped. The orientation is, it's, uh, the, the sign has to do with the orientation, how, it, how the vectors are flipped in relation to each other. Okay, so that's how we do a cross product. By doing this calculation, we can define, yes, whenever a cross product comes up, whenever you need to know, whenever you realize that, hey, I need a cross product here, or hey, I need a vector that's orthogonal to these two vectors, you are going to do a cross product and you're going to do this mnemonic. Yeah, so let's actually do some examples. Okay. We're going to do these three. Did I have any more examples to do? No. Okay. So we're going to do these three examples and that will wrap up this section. Uh, we have a question here. So whenever we see a cross product comes, I use do not. So the cross product used to find vector orthogonals. Yes. The cross product is used. So if you have two vectors and your goal is to find another vector that is orthogonal to both of those vectors at the same time, cross product. That's what you want. Now, a lot of times, just taking the cross product in either order will be fine for the purposes that we will be using. But if it's ever necessary for you to know specifically what direction it points in, which in this class, you don't need to know. In Calc 3, it's going to be important. Um, but if you ever need to know what direction the vector you found is pointing in, you apply the right-hand rule to know. Um, for us, I can't really think of a situation where that's actually going to be important. You just need to be able to find any normal vector. Uh, the direction in which it's pointing is not going to matter. That will matter in vector calculus, which is chapter 13 in your textbook. It, it's, the, the particular direction isn't going to matter here. But just for the day when it does matter, you should know the direction will obey the right-hand rule. All right, so uh, let's, uh, let's continue. Let's do these three examples. Let's uh, do this one first. So here, 
straight up, find the cross product of these two vectors. I just gave you two random vectors. What is the cross product of these two guys? Okay, that's what we're gonna do. So once I see that now, this is Calc 2. You might have a straightforward question like that. In Calc 3, you'll, you'll never have a straightforward question like this. But okay, you know at some point you need to find the cross product of these two vectors. You would immediately jump into the mnemonic. A cross B is going to be I, J, K. All right, 7 p.m. Let's clap for the healthcare workers. Okay. Uh, Let's go. <laughs> so, um, got to keep going. Very grateful to our healthcare workers, but we got to keep going. Um, yes, people are clapping in the chat, just so you know. All right. Uh, so, you immediately set up IJK. The, the guy on the left is who you list first. The A goes first. So, that's one, two, three. The B goes second, three, zero, two. And so uh, sometimes I like to immediately write it in this uh, form. I just know I'm going to take, block out everyone in the same row and column as the I. So it's two times two minus three times zero. Then in the next column, I'm going to open a negative sign and then block out everyone in the same row and column as the J. It's going to be one times two minus three times three. Then in the K, block out everyone in his row and his column. It's going to be one times zero minus two times three. So the cross product of these two is going to be four comma. This is going to be two minus nine, which is minus seven. That's going to be seven comma minus six. That vector is orthogonal to both. And in fact, let's, let's actually double check that we didn't make a mistake. Check. Minus five, what? Where, where did I get a minus five? Uh, let, let's actually check. If I made a mistake, we'll pick it up here. If I take this, if I take this let's call this uh, C. If I take A dot C, what do I get? Uh, one times four plus two times seven plus, well, it would be now be minus three times six, right? One times four, which is four, two times seven, and three times minus six. Does that work? Yes, right? So that's 14 plus four, that's positive 18 minus 18, so that's zero. So yeah, that's perpendicular to A. What if I take B times C? Gosh, I hate arithmetic. Like my brain literally just shut down on me. It's like, I'm not doing this. <laughs> like I, I had to literally coax it into, what is this again? <laughs> See, this is what I miss about having class. I'll, I could just like point at someone in class now and have them do this arithmetic. Okay, so I would do now uh, the B. So it's three times four plus zero times seven plus two times minus six. That is also zero. That's right, push through Kevin. Uh, you can also rewatch it later. A lot of a lot of the things I'm talking about, uh, when once you actually jump in and start practicing, it'll it'll be fine. Like a lot of the concepts, al almost everything I explained before this box, uh, almost everything. You don't really need to know. You need to know this. You need to know what a nor what a cross product does. The fact that it's perpendicular to two vectors involved, that it obeys the right hand rule and that this is how you would compute it. Those are like the most important facts. So if you can only hold on to a few facts right now because your brain is dead, those are the ones that we want to hold on to. Um, so yeah, that actually works. Now, uh, 
Let's do the, the other example. Example, find the vector orthogonal to the plane that passes through these three points. Okay, so now we want to find an, a vector that is orthogonal, AKA perpendicular to a plane. What is that going to look like? So this is the idea. Here's my plane. Let's suppose it's slanted this way. And I have three points in that plane. So this is the point P, which is two comma zero comma minus three. This is the point, let's call it Q, which is three comma one comma zero. And let's call this is the point R, which is five comma two comma two. Now the goal is I want to find a vector that's perpendicular to this plane. So we want this. Or the guy that's in the other direction. I don't particularly care. We want one of these guys. Ideas on how to get to that. Connect two pairs of points, connect them with what? Oh, to create two vectors. Yeah, all right. So what we can do is we can connect this point to that. Let's create a vector. And then uh, we can connect this point to that. That creates another vector. Call this vector A uh, and call the other vector B. And then this will actually be the vector. This will be A cross B. This one would be minus A cross B. Right by the right hand rule. Point my right hand in the direction of A, curl my fingers towards B, stick my thumb up. Uh, a cross B goes up. So uh, if I find A cross B, I will find the guy that points up. Now, technically, you don't need to know which one. It just says find a vector. So I'm just going to find either one. Either order you do, it's not going to matter. OK, so uh, let's actually get that out of the way. So what is the vector A and B here? Uh, we looked at this, was it last class or the class before? Uh, to create the vector, you take the final point minus the initial point. So A is three minus two, one minus zero, zero minus three. So A is one, one, three. B is the final point minus the initial point. So it's five minus two, two minus zero, two minus a minus three. So this is three, two, five. So now if I want a vector, I'm just going to do A cross B. That is going to be I, J, K. One, one, three, three, two, five. This is going to be in the I, block out everyone in that row in that column. One times five minus three times two, comma, minus, block out everyone in the J column and row. We have one times five minus three times three, comma, K, block out everyone in his row and his column. I would have one times two minus three times one. So this is minus one comma, this would be positive four comma, this would be minus one. And that's our guy. This is the guy we want. In fact, he, he's the guy that was pointing up in the picture over here. Okay. Um, we had a third example up here. Okay, boom. All right, find the volume of the parallel piped formed by this guy. So, um, so essentially here, I have something like, a, B, C, 
see and we can actually just like form right so there's some sort of parallelogram like this now i don't know it's exactly oriented like this it's just uh you know real actors uh representing actual people um so might not look like this. So the volume of the, this was property five. So our volume here is going to be, like I said, it's going to be the magnitude of the scalar triple product. Now the scalar triple product uh, that was the expression that looks like uh, A dot B cross C. Now, one thing you could do is you could actually use these properties. Uh, where is it? Use these properties to actually compute that. Um, so you can take B cross C and find that and then dot product it with A. However, uh, here's how it's actually going to look by the way. So this is going to be, it's going to be the magnitude of this determinant. Just list the A's along the top. So the A gets replaced by the I, J, K. The B's along the second row and the C's along the third row. And just find the determinant. And whatever the determinant is, you're going to actually take its magnitude to return a positive volume. So in this case, uh, A is one, okay, let's do that so I won't have to scroll up. Yes, it's called, the. it's not, well, this won't give you a vector. It's actually gonna be a scalar. But this expression here is called the scalar triple product. That's the name for it. I, I mentioned it up here. Scalar triple product or the box triple product or the triple scalar product or the triple box product. They're all the same name. Scalar triple product is the one I hear most commonly. It refers to property five that we have here, A dot B cross C. It turns out that that guy, if you write, write out what it looks like, if you take, where are we? If you take A dot B cross C, it becomes this determinant and a determinant by definition is the signed volume of the parallelopiped. So in this case, uh, we would have uh, one, four, minus seven, two, minus one, four, zero, minus 9, 18. And again, what we're going to do, uh, I would much rather go down here, but I only told you guys about the first row, so let's stick with the definitions that we have. So it's going to be one times, block out everyone in his row in his column, minus 18 plus uh, four times nine. <sighs> What's four times nine? Is that 36? minus the four times block I own his row and his column, it's two times 18, which is 32, minus four times zero, plus a minus seven, times, block out everyone in his row and his column, minus two times nine, that's minus 18 minus zero. Thirty two should be thirty six here. Okay, I'll take your word for it. And what is that now?
it's actually zero. Because uh, 36 is two times 18, so this is eight times 18. So I have 18 minus eight times 18 plus seven times 18. So, you know, one apple minus eight apples plus seven apples, you get zero. It's actually zero. What does that mean? A, B, C are actually coplanar. Now, I, I spoke about that earlier as well. If we look up, uh, ba, 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 where are we? Here, coplanar. It pretty much means that A, B, and C lie in the same plane. So the picture actually does not look like that. It's not a box. It's, it's actually the situation where they all lie in a plane. So this is, this is the plane. And my A, my B, and my C are all actually in the plane. They don't actually raise to create a 3D figure. So the volume of the box, the parallel pipette is zero because they're all in the same plane. All right. So that, ladies and gentlemen, was the intro to the cross product. This is the mnemonic that helps us compute it. Once you do that, now you know um, doing this mnemonic, doing this calculation to create that, you would have created a vector that is one, it's orthogonal to the two vectors that is involved. Two, it will obey the right hand rule in terms of what direction it's pointing in. Is it going to be pointing up or down or left or right or whatever? And three, the magnitude of this vector will be the same as the area of the parallelogram formed by A and B. Okay, Whew. all right, all right, all right. Now, hopefully that wasn't too much to absorb because we're going to start talking about uh, some other things right now that's uh, probably going to cause a mind equals blown moment for some people. So, we are now going to talk about scalar times a vector in a cross product. Uh, well, I, I, I think the only time I mentioned that was this thing here. Yeah, I mean, you can factor off the scalar off either vector. So, I don't know. Pretty much once you get the last three examples, I think you should be good with cross products. Like that's the, the what you need to know about cross products is pretty much illustrated by these three examples here. All right, so uh, let's move on. We're going to talk about at least, uh, this, this took a lot longer than I thought it would, um, but we are going to now talk about, at least introduce the topic, lines and planes. We are going to want to know how to talk about lines and planes in three space. Now, for those of you who might be thinking, why, why are we gonna talk about equations of lines and planes again? Like I know about the equation of a line. Do you? Do you really? Do you really know the equation of a line? What is the equation of a line? Now, you pick out any school kid old enough to walk home by themselves, and you ask them, what is the equation of a line? They're gonna be like, y equals mx plus b. This is a line with slope m and y intercept b. And this is wrong. This is no longer the case. y equals b is the equation of a line? False. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what if I told you y equals mx plus b is a plane? In three space, y equals mx plus b is not the equation of a line. y equals mx plus b actually gives you a plane in three space. This is something that we're going to justify, and we're also going to talk about what, how would you find the equation of a line? Like, if I, I've lived my whole life uh, thinking y equals m plus b was the equation of a line. Well, you were in the matrix. And now I'm giving you the red pill. And I'm trying to tell you y equals mx plus b is a plane. You just saw a projection 
in two space of a line. And that's what the matrix wanted you to see, but that's not what's really there. Um, so that's what we're going to do here. So let's talk about <laughs> uh, what a line would look like. <laughs> look, Neo, I, I know you're upset, but uh, life isn't what you thought it was, okay? I don't, I don't know how else to explain it to you. Y equals M is supposed to be not a line anymore. Get that out of your head. Once you're in three dimensions or higher, Y equals M is supposed to be gives you a plane, not a line. So now at this point, I'm like, well, what is a line then, smarty pants? Okay, let's actually talk about this. Okay, let's actually find the equation of a line. And let's actually start to use language that would be beneficial in three space, meaning we're going to talk about things in terms of vectors and directions and all that good stuff. And I was very tempted to actually start this with a whole background discussion on uh, vector curves and vector functions. But after going through that whole thing with cross products, I don't think I want to go down that road anymore. And by the way, you're going to be talking a lot about that in Calc 3. So I don't want to take the pleasure away from your Calculus 3 instructor. Uh, you'll talk a lot about that stuff in Chapter 13. So we're going to pretty much just jump in right away, only deal with uh, equations of lines and planes, and not worry about how they fit into the bigger picture of this three-dimensional universe that we find ourselves in. We're just going to directly focus on lines and planes. Okay? So how would we go about focus, uh, finding the equation of a line? So here's what we're going to do. Suppose I know a direction of the line, meaning I know a vector that is parallel to the line, right? Suppose I also know a point on the line, x naught, y naught, z naught, right? So just like with uh, back in uh, 2D, if you want to find a line, you need a point and a direction. It was the point and the slope, right? You could find the point slope form, et cetera. We are going to want to look for the same things here. Suppose I know a point and a direction. I know a point on the line, I know a direction of the line. So um, here is what we have. So this is three space. And this is my line floating through three space. Now, suppose I know a point on this line. Okay. So I know a point on this line. Uh, let's call this x naught, y naught, z naught. I also know the direction in which the line is moving. So I also know a vector that is on this line. Let's call that vector V. Now, what I want to do is ultimately my goal is going to be to find an arbitrary point on this line. How can I describe the X, Y, and Z coordinates that would run along such an object, right? So we want to find this. How do we describe all the points that are here? So here's uh, one thing we can do, is we can create a vector So I'm going to connect this point to that point. Imagine that it's connected with a vector. Okay, so I don't know what I want to do. So if I connect this point to that point with a vector. Now, because of what we know about vectors being parallel, it's of course going to be parallel to V. So this vector is going to have uh, the form some scalar times the vector v. Next, what I'm going to do is I am going to take a position vector from the origin to hit the point that I know about. Call this r naught. I am then going to take another vector that's going to a, a position vector that's going to hit this arbitrary point. Call that r. And then by 
vector addition, what would we realize? Well, if I take this vector plus that vector, I will get that vector. So in other words, I would get the fact that I can write my r as r naught plus t times v. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the equation of a line. Now, if I write this r as a vector that's hitting x, y, z, this is a vector that's hitting x naught, y naught, z naught. And this is just some scalar times the vector v. And let's let's even let's let's give uh, let's give v components. Let's call v the vector a, b, c. Right. This now gives us the equation that will define a line. Hence, we have this. This is called the vector form of the equation of a line. R equals R naught plus T times V. That is a line, not Y equals MX plus B. This is what a line looks like. And that is actually going to work in all dimensions, including the two-dimensional case. You can flesh this out, like how I mentioned here, as this thing, right? So I can add these two vectors together, and the first component would be X naught plus AT. The second component would be Y naught plus BT. Third component will be Z naught plus CT. No, y equals mx plus b is not useless. It's just not a line. It's actually a plane. So it's, it's not like I'm saying throw away y equals mx plus b. That's, it's not that serious. Uh, we can still hang out with him. He's just not who we thought he was. That's basically what I'm trying to say. He was acting like you know we were cool, like he, we knew him, like he was our friend. But really, y equals mx plus b had a dark secret. He was a lot more dimensional than we thought he was. We thought he was just straight up, just you know, hanging out with us on the corner, but nah, he's going to college behind our backs, moving up in the world. He has like more dimension to him than we knew about. So um, it's not, we're not throwing away Y equals MX plus B. I'm just saying it's not what you, what you thought, thought it was. <laughs> okay, so that's the equation of a line from now on. That's how you know it. Okay, now we can actually, uh, once we know this vector is equal to that vector, because of what we know about vectors, corresponding components must be equal. So I can actually isolate the x, x equals this, y equals that, and z equals that. This is the parametric form. In other words, I just can describe a line with parametric equations. And we've seen something like this before, right? So it turns out the parametric equation for a line is the better way to look at a line, especially when you're in something higher than two dimensions. Okay, so this is why I wanted to talk about vector curves moving on, but uh, parametric equations, you can actually see them showing up here. Now what we can do here, and this is uh, something that is an optional thing. It's, it's not very common, but you could do it. You can solve for t. If you solve for t in the first equation, you would get x minus x naught divided by a. Uh, you would also get t equals y minus y naught divided by b. And you would also get t equals z minus z naught divided by c. Now, because all of these guys are equal to t, all of these guys must be equal to each other. And so you can get this form of the equation of a line. Uh, that's called the, uh, the symmetric form. I don't know why this one has uh, parentheses in it. So that's called the symmetric form. Not very commonly used. Most of the time you're going to see a line either in this form or in that form, the vector or the parametric form. Now, because we're dividing by A, B, and C, you might have to worry about, well, what if we're divided by zero? If either of these guys are divided are zero, then what we do is we separate that guy. We form the equation with all the guys who are remaining and we list that guy separately. No, parametric equations do not have R and theta. Polar equations have R and theta. And you can think of polar coordinates as a specific instance of parametric equations. Parametric equations are far more general. 
All right, so uh, moving on. Uh, da, da, da. So one thing I can say about these, this one is not very common, but you should be able to convert between any of these equations um, at any given time. And that being said, and I also spoke about how to create line segments in, I wanna say two lectures ago, when we did parametric equations, I spoke about how to create a, a parametric form for a line segment. Uh, so I'm not gonna go over that. We're just actually gonna jump into some examples. So let's do some examples. here. All right, uh, let's, and there are some more examples I wanna do over here as well, but let's start by, these guys out of the way and we'll come and pick them off one by one okay all right find the vector and parametric forms of the equation of the line that passes through this point passes through the point one two three and it's parallel to this vector in other words um, this is basically saying that guy is your x naught y naught z naught and this guy is your V in the formulas. And so there's not really much else to do. So if you want to talk about the vector form, this is X, Y, Z equals X naught, Y naught, Z naught. And you can turn these into vectors because the coordinate and the vector is interchangeable because we developed this equation using a position vector. So it's actually, uh, you can use the vector and the point interchangeably. Uh, plus T times V. And so what we have here is just X, Y, Z equals one, two, three, plus T times minus one, zero, two. So we can take that as the vector form of the equation of a line or you can combine it into one big vector if you want. X, Y, Z equals one minus T comma two comma three plus two T. Now, of course, you can realize that the equation of a line is just a vector where each coordinate behaves like Y equals MX plus B. It has a linear expression in each coordinate, but it has, it has multiple coordinates. T is the quote unquote parameter. So T is just the guy that you're tracking. So T is like the new input. So a line has, is a one dimensional guy. So it has one parameter. And so this is like your independent variable. So pretty much if I plug in different T values, I get different points. And then this vector will trace out all those points. So for different T, I get different points along this line. And this R vector is just running along the line, tracing out all the points. So with this, if T is zero, I get one comma two comma three. So that is on the line. I can plug in T equals one, you get zero comma two comma five. That point is on the line and so on and so forth. So, so the line is, is like doing its thing. So that's your line. And then in three space, I have pretty much this vector that hits all points along this line. So for different T values, it will hit different points along the line. So this is like T naught, and then, uh, so this is R of T naught, and then this will be R of T one, and then this will be R of T two, et cetera. And so it'll trace out points along this line for different T values. Yeah, so the T here is kind of like what your X would be in 2D if you had the Y as the dependent variable. Okay. All right, so that's the vector form of the equation of a line. Parametric form is just now you setting each coordinate equal to each other. So for the parametric, you would set X equals one minus T y equals two, z equals three plus two t, and that's your parametric form. All 
All right, and that is that example. Let's uh, do this one. Find the equation of a line that passes through these two points. Ideas? So call this P and Q. So we have a line, P is on the line and Q is on the line. Ideas for how to find the equation of the line. Mm -hmm. uh, we can find the vector V by say taking final minus initial. So use V equals can use V equals PQ. So that's four minus one, two. Then use either point use x naught, y naught, z naught equals minus one, two, zero. You could use q, but I just picked the other one. Now, it didn't tell me a specific form to find the equation of the line in, so I'm just going to put it in vector form. This implies the line is x, y, z, equals minus one, two, zero, plus T times four minus one, two. And that's the vector form. We subtracted to create the vector, to create this vector V, because I have this point, I have a vector going from this point to that point. To create that vector, you take final point minus initial point. So, so this would be the three minus the minus one, comma, the one minus the two, comma, the two minus the zero. All right, um, moving on to the next problem. Where does the line intersect the XZ plane? So that'll probably be a point, or let's just say where, we don't even know if it's a point. And it's XZ plane, XZ plane, yes. XZ plane, yes, it means Y equals zero, therefore, So yeah, at this, uh, from this, you would realize that, uh, you'd realize that this, you'd realize that this means y equals zero. Uh, the answer is yes, but uh, I think you're thinking harder than you had to be. So just set y equals zero is the wording here. And we know what the y is for this line. This means that y is actually two minus t. So then your t equals two. And so your point is going to be when you plug in t equals two for this line. So your x is going to be minus one plus four times two. Your y is of course going to be zero and your z is going to be zero plus two times two.
And yes, you can look at it as moving in increments, but if I gave you a weird number here, it's probably gonna be weird to think about that. What I would do is set the coordinate equals zero that you want, solve for the T value, and then just plug it in. So the point is going to be uh, seven comma zero comma four. Yes. So the numbers were nice here. You could do it the way you thought about it, but um, I would, this is more general. If the numbers are ugly, you would want to keep track of it like this. Uh, where does the line intersect this surface? What is the surface? It's x plus 2y minus 3z equals 5 x plus 2y minus 3z equals 5. And the line we're talking about is the guy that has x, y, z equals minus 1 plus 4t, y would be uh, 2 minus t, And Z would be 2T. Yeah, you said each coordinate equal. Um, so uh, pretty much you plug this in for X. So your X plus two y minus three z would be equal to one minus one plus four t plus two times two minus t minus three times two t. And that should be equal to five. And so we'd have minus one plus four t plus four minus two t minus six t equals five. So uh, we would have, what is minus 8t plus 4t, so that's minus 4t. And then you'd have uh, minus 1 plus 4 is positive 3. Move it over, so you get 2. So you would get t equals minus 1 half. And so now you want to figure out the point. So the point is going to be, what's the point of all this? Uh, the point is going to be, plug in t equals minus a half into this. Plug t equals minus a half into the line equation. That's going to give you the point. So minus a half plugged in here, that'll be minus two minus one, that's minus three comma, minus a half goes in here, that's two plus a half, that's four over two, that's five over two comma, uh, plug it in here, you get minus one. So that's where the point, where it will actually intersect that surface. Now the question is, what is that surface x plus 2y minus 3z equals 5? It turns out that it is a plane, which we will discover soon. Uh, planes, there we are. We're going to talk about that pretty soon. But we'll, we'll probably wrap up after this example, though. Um, Give you the equation for the line segment. Does anything? Okay. 
So let's actually go. Okay. Give the equation of a line segment from this to that. And we kind of already spoke about this. So I'm just going to jump into it. Um, we see that our x value goes from 1 to minus 3. We see that our y value goes from 2 to 0. We see that our z value goes from 3, and it stays at 3. So pretty much x, y, z, you want to describe that as to what it does. x starts at 1. To get to minus 3, we subtract 2, comma. y starts at 2. To get to 0, we subtract 2, comma. Uh, Z starts at three. To get to three, you would subtract zero. So it stays at three. And then you set T goes from zero to one. And that's, uh, that's your line segment. That's using a form that we've had in a previous class. We spoke about parametric equations. So uh, These we will do, uh, go back to what question, Kevin? Okay, so we'll, we'll actually wrap up there. Um, so I'll probably leave this up for you guys and you can try actually doing this uh, for next time. So next time you start, we'll just actually jump into doing some computational examples. Um, so two lines are parallel if their direction vectors are parallel. These should almost be obvious. They're orthogonal if their direction vectors are orthogonal. And uh, these are the situations for any two lines. They will either intersect, they will be parallel, or they will be quote unquote skew. Skew means they neither intersect nor are they parallel. And uh, in 2D, that's impossible. However, in 3D, that's a very po real possibility. Um, in 2D, on, in the xy plane only, if your lines live in the xy plane, then they're either parallel or they intersect. There is no other possibility. In three dimensions, there is a third possibility. This possibility is called skew. Um, and yeah, so in this question here, I give you some pairs of lines written in parametric form. Uh, your goal, your mission, if you choose to accept it, or you will actually just do this. Um, for, try to think of this for next time. It's to determine are these two lines parallel or do they intersect or are they skew, neither parallel nor intersecting? Try to figure that out for those lines. And that would be the, uh, I think, the last example that we had for equations of lines. Once you cover those, we'll go to planes. And once we finish planes, we are going to go to. I believe the next topic is quadric surfaces. So we're going to learn to graph all this, all sorts of fancy stuff in uh, three dimensions. Okay, so, all right, it's getting late. Uh, Kevin's tired. Let's, um, let's go. Yes, the mock exam is up. So uh, go. It's not in Pearson, it's on the class webpage. So back where I used to post quizzes and stuff, the answers and quizzes, where you'll find the syllabus and all that good stuff. So it's on the map and it's on the class webpage. So if you go, if you scroll down to the section, there's a test review section. You'll see a review for test one is currently up. Uh, I mentioned the topics that are, in, uh, that are on test one. What I would say to do is to read through those topics, study up on those topics, and then take the mock test, pretend it's a test. So put all your stuff away and then actually try to do it. 
um, in the allotted time. I believe the time is an hour and a half. So there are seven problems and it's across the topics that I mentioned in the review. So um, there are instructions there and everything. Yeah, we missed those integral signs, huh? Don't worry. Uh, in Calc three, you are going to <laughs> you are going to have all the integrals you want. You'll have even two or three at a time. You'll have an integral threesome. Uh, triple integrals. They are very important. Um, so yeah, it's coming. Don't worry about that. Anyway, I will see you guys. Um, good night. Take care. Be safe. Uh, as always, I'll post uh, the YouTube video with this, uh, the, these notes in the description, uh, and you will be able to uh, try those problems that we that I left off for last time. That being said, uh, good night and good luck, everybody, as they say. I'll see you guys around. I'll see you guys on Monday. Uh, go do the review. It's on the class webpage. All right. Ciao.